Um, so I don't say I have all the answers. I say that I have studied one aspect of the UFO phenomenon and then I, I can verify beyond a reasonable doubt that whoever they are, however they get here, whatever their, their game plan is, I know one of the things they do is monitor and interfere with the functionality of nuclear weapons in both America and Russia. Why do you think they do that? Uh, my opinion is that they do not want humans who suddenly now have these weapons just in the last 70 years where we can literally destroy the whole planet. I mean, you know, we can create hundreds of millions of deaths. Uh, there's a phenomenon called nuclear winter, winter where if you explode enough nuclear weapons, there's enough soot and debris in the atmosphere carried by the, the jet stream. The northern hemisphere would be blanketed in such a dark shroud. You cannot grow crops. You cannot grow food. So you have hundreds of million people dead in the explosions, but then you have conceivably a billion or two billion humans starving because you can't grow crops for a year or two until the sky clears. The but, but why would so-called aliens or otherworldly beings be interested in what we're doing here on planet Earth? I obviously don't know, but th my opinion is that they, they perhaps are like a parent. Like parents, they see a young child about to touch a hot stove, slap the hand. You know, they don't want to, us to destroy this planet. But I say, uh, you know, another possibility is they may have bases here under the ocean, and, and if we destroy the environment, we may destroy their operations here. More likely, they are trying to prevent a primitive race, humans, from doing damage to itself. And would that mean that they're moral and ethical? One could interpret it that way. Does that mean, on the other hand, there are some just very, um, neutral scientific reason for them not wanting us to destroy the earth who knows who knows i don't know all i say the strength of my program the reason why i am invited on on larry king the reason why cnn shows up at my press conferences is because i don't make claims that i can't verify that i can't support i say here's what the documents say here's what the the vetted military witnesses say draw your own conclusions What I can say with certainty is that the U.S. government since the 1940s has been analyzing situations where craft are flying around weapons, nuclear weapons sites. The radar data confirmed that these craft can do things that no aircraft on Earth can do. They fly thousands of miles per hour. They instantly do right angle turns, 90 degree turns, or instantly stop. The documents say this. There are multiple radar scopes, you know, picking up these objects. The people on the ground who see them say they're circular in shape or triangular or cigar shaped. We don't have aircraft like that. The Russians don't. The Danish people don't. So in my view, this is a technology from off the earth. It's been said that the military, particularly in the U.S. and possibly also in Russia, has highly developed technology that is approximately about 50 to 100 years ahead of what the general public has been told. Don't you think that they have this possibility? You, you've been researching military bases. You were born at a military base. You can tell, uh, tell us that. But don't you think it could be military crafts that people are seeing when they're witnessing UFOs? But what is being reported now is identically reported in the 1940s. In the 1940s, Russia was destroyed, the Germans destroyed their technology. America certainly didn't have flying saucers in, in the 1940s. And so what is being reported, incredible cases, documents of flying disks and so on, at that time there was no country on earth that had that technology. Whether we have secret craft now, the Russians, some other countries, possibly, but if you have a secret craft, you don't fly it around the public. You keep it secret. In time of war, you use it as a weapon. So if America has flying saucers, you don't fly them over New York or London or Copenhagen. You keep them at your secret base, and in time of war, then you use it. So I think that what is being reported are most likely craft from other, some other place. Maybe the, they would do it to implant some kind of fear in the public. Couldn't that be the case? I, Everything is possible, but what is more likely or less likely, I think the best explanation for the technology and all of the other factors involved, that these are visitors from some other world or perhaps many other worlds. I can 
pro proved by hundreds and hundreds of documents that UFOs have flown around American nuclear weapon sites, and in some cases the weapons are impacted, they malfunction. There are hundreds of documents saying that. I've interviewed these 140 individuals, military launch officers, missile launch officers, who say that an object, circular object, hovered above their missiles and the missiles malfunction. Is that scientific proof that that has happened? No, but you have credible people. The U.S. government uh, gave the trust to launch nuclear weapons. They were vetted, they were tested, they were level-headed, they weren't drinkers, they didn't smoke marijuana, you know, they're, they, you know, very credible people and 140 of them now have talked to me over the years saying UFOs shut down my nuclear. But could those scientists possibly be, be bought by the, by, the, by the government to do this, this work and implant this kind of information? Mm, my sources are not, mil scient not scientists, they're military launch officers and or targeting officers. Um, the likelihood of that is not high. These people have waited years and years and years to come forward. They were afraid that uh, if they spoke to me, they would be go to go to jail because many of them in the 1960s and 70s, they see these incidents. They were involved in these incidents. The military intelligence groups came in and say, "Tell us what you know, and then forget what you know." Sign this piece of paper, and if you if you sign this, and then you speak to anyone about what you know, you will go to jail. Uh -huh. And so these people are very, very or worse, maybe even uh, at least in jail. Um, you know, most of, in my view, most of what you read about UFOs on the internet is wild speculation. It's not substantiated with fact. You have to separate the signal from the noise. What is the kind of rumor mill? What is the, ooh, let's talk about this, that, and the other, but we have no facts to support what we say? That's a waste of my time. You know, I want to talk about the documents. I want to talk about the military witnesses, you know, the, the eyewitnesses who are involved in these incidents. And when did you start interviewing these people? When did it all begin for you? My father was in the Air Force for 20 years, and in 1966 and 67, he was stationed. Uh, he was posted at a place called Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana, which is a nuclear missile base. Uh, without going into great detail, you were born at, uh, at, uh, on this base, right? Another base, Sandia Base, where a nuclear base in New Mexico. But uh, at Malmstrom in Montana, it was a Minuteman missile nuclear base, 100, I think, 150 nuclear missiles scattered in the countryside underground in these silos. Uh, Ten missiles are controlled by a central launch control facility. There were 15 of those, so 150 missiles altogether. And the rumors that my father heard in this building he worked with had, had high-powered radar, military radar. They were picking up unknown objects flying around the missile sites and hovering over the missile sites. And this was in 1967. By 1973, there began to be in, the, in magazine articles and in books people who worked for the military or worked for the missile program who said, I know about that and would talk about that, where UFOs would hover above missiles and the missiles would malfunction. So by 1973, I thought, well, I know a little bit about this. Other people are saying it's true. I think this is important. I think someone should get these witnesses' testimony on record. So I began interviewing and tape recording these people. And by 1981, I felt I had enough evidence to make a, a credible case. This is real and going on and I went out on the American College lecture circuit. I've spoken over, at over 500 universities in America and Oxford University in England saying, here's what the documents say, here's what the military eyewitnesses say, draw your own conclusions. Have you yourself ever encountered a UFO or been in the presence of extraterrestrials or interdimensionals? Uh, I have seen six objects between 1971 and 2001 in the sky. Um, the, all I can say is they were, two of them were discs, flying saucers, one was cigar-shaped, cigar uh, had no fins, no rocket exhaust, it was not a cruise missile, it was quite clearly a metallic cigar-shaped object, and all three of those objects made no noise. I saw them moving across the sky in broad daylight, and the other three objects I saw were pl plasma balls that were performing maneuvers. One did a right angle turn, a U-turn, I should say, and zipped away. Not ball Which was not a human military craft. In my view, no. And these were, this, that one was hovering over the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So it wasn't even a, a, at the nuclear base you saw them? Well, 
none of the objects I saw were near nuclear sites, no. How many of the military veterans that you interviewed have, have come forward publicly like you and spoken about it with uh, you? Well, my book was published in 2008, and I mentioned about 90 names, I believe, 90-something names. But when my book came out, I was on Larry King Live. Um, I held a press conference in Washington. CNN streamed that live. So as a result of this publicity I've been getting in the last four or five years, many more witnesses have approached me, and I now have 142 or three who have said I was involved. Now, when someone comes to me and says, I was a, a missile launch officer and I know about a UFO because it hovered over my missiles, the first thing I say is send me your military records, DD-214 form. It verifies that they were at those bases during those years. It doesn't say whether they saw a UFO or not, but it proves that they were launch officers or whatever. And so I start from there. Um, most of the credible witnesses that I've spoken to are very reluctant. You know, I have to talk them into being interviewed. Uh, you know, some of them wait five years, ten years. They, that we'll right. t we'll talk, and I call them, and they say, no, maybe maybe a little in the future. And some wait ten years before they finally sit down and let me tape record them, yeah. uh, because they're concerned that you know their retirement pay will suddenly go away, mm -hmm. or the FBI will knock on their door or whatever. So yeah. Why is it so important, vitally important for you to actually speak out publicly about this and, uh, and actually to urge the government to disclose the UFO phenomena? That is the most difficult question for me to answer because I don't know the answer. Um, I can't tell you why I'm so driven, but you know, this is, this is what I've done for 40 years. I worked a, a day job. I was a laboratory analyst for Phillips Semiconductors. That's how I earned my living. But I've also been on the lecture circuit since 1981, and I feel compelled to let the American people know and the world. Now we have the internet and much more information exchange around the planet. And now you're in Copenhagen for the Exopolitics Conference. Exactly. And I just feel that if, if, if this planet is being visited by beings from elsewhere, and if one of the things they're doing here is monitoring and tampering with our nuclear weapons, that is something the governments do not have a right to keep from people everywhere. People in Denmark need to know the truth. People in America need to know the truth. People in China need to know the truth. Ninety percent of what I read about UFOs on the Internet are unproven claims, unsubstantiated claims. Um, some of them are just religious beliefs, some of them are, you know, there are mentally ill people who c can type and say things online who, you know, really, ha you know, would think you're an alien and I'm an alien. And but there's also been researchers and people who've worked in military bases who've come out and said it. Even former MK Ultra mind-controlled uh, governmental slaves have come out later and said, after deprogramming, that they witnessed this, that they experienced this under this closed government secret programming. I don't believe were. those claims. I don't believe those claims. Why not? Uh, because they've not provided any evidence that I would consider credible supporting data for documentation. Um, for example, in the early 1980s, I helped expose a disinformation scheme being operated out of Kirtland Air Force Base, what's called Office of Special Investigations, where supposedly the aliens were working with uh, the American government and we were flying joint aircraft missions or spacecraft missions to Mars. All sorts of stuff appeared in these documents. Linda Mooton Howe, a re researcher, uh, Accepted, accepted all this as true without really trying to verify it and has been making these claims all over the world for 25 years now that these documents prove that the aliens are working with the government. Well, what But it's very difficult to actually, it's very, it's very difficult to, to, to get some solid proof, you know, it's very on difficult the to present it. On the contrary, what I did was research these claims and I and a man named Barry Greenwood, another man named Bob Todd, what we proved beyond any doubt was that this group OSI at Kirtland Air Force Base was forging documents. And as recently as 2009, one of the people involved with it, a man named Sergeant Richard Doty, admitted to me that he, in fact, was forging documents under orders, bogus documents about aliens meeting with Eisenhower and the U.S. government. So, you know, People make claims, you know, I was involved in this, I was involved in that. Some gullible people who call themselves researchers, and they really probably are not, accept that and talk to the media about it. Meanwhile, 
me and some other people actually did real research, found out that the typewriter analysis, this was before you know word processors, if you have flaws in typewriters, like a T is slightly lower and the W has a little mark on it, we found documents that allegedly were from the 1970s and, and the 40s, and they all have that identical flaw. And we have an independent letter from this Sergeant Richard Doty. He typed to a civilian, had all those identical flaws, and that typewriter is in Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico in the early 80s. And yet all these other forged documents showing the identical flaws were from the supposedly the 40s, supposedly from the 70s. So the fake documents were actually, what you're saying, they were actually implanted by the government or military officials? Correct. In order to Confu make the, to confuse the, the audience, to, the, the, to, the general popu to population? Make, to make researchers and, and the public to run in circles. Um, the, the Roswell... Why, why would they do that? To, to keep people in the dark about what's really happening. For example, Roswell, the, the alleged recovery right. of a crashed UFO. I believe that happened, and for example, there's a retired Air Force Brigadier General named Arthur E. Exxon. Arthur Exxon, a retired general, has publicly say it, said, and you know, in writing and in audio taped interviews, that this was an alien spacecraft, that he was at Wright Field, later Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, renamed. When the debris came in, he was not directly involved, but he knew people who did the analysis. They said this was nothing like on Earth like this. Okay, so Roswell happened. Now, just when the Roswell story came out in the early 80s and was beginning to be, get some momentum, this same OSI agent, Richard Doty, contacted Linda Howe. She had a million dollar budget to create a film for HBO Network on the cover-up. They took her in and said, Linda, we like what you're doing. We're, if you just work with us on our timetable, wait to be a little patient. We will give you the film of the Roswell recovery operation. I have all this in writing. She is writing to HBO and, and they're writing to her. They're saying, Linda, you're behind schedule. Get the film made. She's saying, my source at Kirtland Air Force Base says if we just are a little patient and we wait a little longer, they're going to give us the Roswell recovery film. This went on for months and months. Finally, HBO said, Psh, we need, we're going to, you know, you're not getting the job done. We're taking our money back. So there's a lot of purposely planned uh, disinformation In and In this fraud. case, there's, there's just an open and shut By case. the U.S. government. Correct. It's called disinformation. Right. And so what you have is a credible case. To Ros confuse the audience, the, to, the general population. Well, for example, um, General Exxon says, okay, this is an alien spaceship that's been recovered. Linda Howe says, yes, and I was also given documents uh, that said that the aliens are working with the government, and I'm going to get the film of that recovery operation. Well, when that's proven to be a fraud then people say, well, how do we know General Exxon isn't feeding us nonsense? So it discredits him by association. Linda Howe has done so much damage around the world, whether she accepts that fact or not, by passing all this bogus information off as fact. She did it not even a month ago, a month ago in Washington at the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure. She mentioned a document called the SOM Field Manual, supposedly a military document talking about how you recover spaceships, what you do, crash spaceships. It's been proven as a forgery. There are uh, one document expert that, that I've been in touch with found 50 factual errors. Linda Howe does not do that research. She's not, not an authority on that. And so she gets on camera in Washington and said, this has really, really stood the test of time. It stands up. Bull, it has not. And the uh, document experts, if she would just talk to them and get, our, get off her ego high horse and talk to the people who've done the research, she would know that she's been duped. She's been suckered. And she, by talking about all this nonsense publicly, repeatedly over 20 years, is just creating a disinformation bonanza for the government. So you don't think that the government at all has any involvement with UFOs or no, alien, no. alien be beings? No, uh, oh, no. On the contrary, they absolutely, they know these things are real. What do you think is the most s profound, solid evidence of extraterrestrial existence? Well, Again, I, w I don't take it that far. What I say is there are radar cases of objects from the 1940s to as recently as a year ago. Objects that are tracked on radar who can fly th which can fly thousands of miles per hour, instantly stop in midair, or instantly do right angle turns. 
No one has produced any credible evidence to the public anywhere in the world that any country on earth has craft that can do that. But the documents that have been released to the public through the Freedom of Information Act confirmed that this was tra first being tracked in the 1940s. Objects flying in American airspace that were vastly beyond American technology. So in my view, what I don't say, I don't say that's proof of alien visitation. I say one likely explanation for these data is that these are craft from some other world. Can we depend on, on all the information we can get from the Freedom of Information Act? Is that, could some of that be implanted as well? What you try to do is when you get a document is find witnesses that might still be alive who can corroborate what's in that. I've done that many times. Um, what you uh, also have to assume is, you know, when these documents were written and describing these very amazing things, the, that law did not exist. Uh, the government who, <coughs> agent who wrote that did not think that would ever be declassified or see the light of day. If it was very sensitive, that would probably be kept secret in perpetuity. But then in the 1970s, the, this law began to be used with some success. Um, but... <coughs> The, it's, it's not a panacea, it's not a, a completely viable way of accessing information because uh, the CIA, for example, um, it's now known in references from other documents about top secret UFO documents that CIA has. If you write to them, they'll respond to your freedom of information request saying, we have no top secret documents on UFOs. So you can't really depend on that, the well, freedom that's of it. information. Uh, I don't think they're feeding That's both. also slightly vague. I don't think they're feeding bogus documents. I don't think they're... they're you don't think that? Not the military. That's a very important statement. I'm a w unaware of any case where one could say that this was a, a document was forged and released through the FOIA. What happened with Linda Mooton Howe was she was led into this office at this, this intelligence, counterintelligence group and, and handed these through the, the hand, you know, given these to look at. Not but it could be compartmentalization on uh, need-to-know basis, you know, that some people know more and some people know less, and, you know, it's just, it, it, it could happen, couldn't it? Certainly. I mean, everything can happen. Any possibility under the sun, I would say, let's narrow it down. What have we found? What, what is the evidence we have in our hands? But do you suggest? think that the governments in, in America and Europe and Russia know of alien existence and UFO existence, and they're concealing the, the evidence to the general public, right? I won't use the word alien. What I will say right. is they know that there are advanced craft that have been tracked on radar that are vastly beyond even what America has now or Russia has now. And these reports go back to the 1940s. And they know that these craft exist. They know that they, run, they can outrun our fastest jets. They know, in my case, that many times they come in and hover over nuclear missiles and then the missiles malfunction. They know those things. Whether they know beyond a doubt whether, in fact, they have a spat, uh, crash spaceship in, in uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, like General Exxon says, I don't know. Um, but they know that there are advanced technology operating here, and I think the pe at the highest level, the people who make the decisions, make the policy, I think they know beyond any doubt that th this is alien visitation. How about some of the 140 people you interviewed? Have you never come across somebody who said that they've seen aliens or extraterrestrial beings at military bases and they're aware of, of the fact that uh, the government is possibly working with aliens or None have some of the technology? Not one. Not one. Not one. Not one. And the, 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 the people that I've interviewed, as I said earlier, they're very reluctant to talk to you. Some of them have second thoughts. They'll say, okay, I'll sit down with you, and then, I, you know, then they don't, don't return my phone calls, and finally it's five years later before they sit down. The people talking about aliens working in Hangar B with our troops and all this, those are the ones that just gush the information. They, they want, they'll come to you, you know, come interview me. I want to tell you all my secrets. I know what the government's doing, blah, blah, blah. Those are the liars, you know, the ones, the ones who can prove with their service records. But what if they want to get the, the message across as strongly as you do? Well, if they're making it up, it doesn't matter what their motivation is. If they're, if what they're, if they're not making it up? Well, in my view, if you're going to make a claim that the government is working with aliens, then you need to have some evidence to produce that, to, to verify that to some degree or another. What is your best evidence? 
when you go out and lecturing and talking to people and give speeches like yesterday? Um, I have documents from the Air Force, the FBI, and the CIA that say UFOs visited nuclear weapons sites on many, many, many occasions during the Cold War era. The documents say that. Then I have found in the cases that I've learned about witnesses, I've spent 40 years. It's taken, you know, 140 people over 40 years is not that many people. I've interviewed probably a thousand veterans who, you know, they said, yeah, I heard about it through the grapevine. Well, you know, that doesn't tell me anything. If you were an eyewitness or, you know, you, you were directly involved, then I want to talk to you. And some of the people who say, I was involved and I'm never going to talk to you, and I've had people say that, they say, don't call me again. Um, so it's, it's you, you make, uh, you use the evidence that you have and try to make some sense of it. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, many pieces are missing, but there's enough pieces there, in my view, to prove that these advanced craft, not only here, but in the former Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, there was a period in the early 90s where Western researchers and journalists went to Russia, and George Knapp, who works in America, actually got documents confirming that the Russians had incidents, the Soviets, where objects hovered over their missiles and the missiles, you know, have m mechanical problems. Same thing that my sources are telling me from America. Um, there are, there's a case, the Bent Waters case in England in December of 80, where uh, we had one of the largest nuclear weapons storage areas. The deputy base commander of that base, Colonel Charles Halt, said he heard on a radio that a saucer hovered over it and sent down laser-like beams, okay? This is in 1980. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, a document from KGB came out from 1989, July, saying that an object hovered over the Kapustin Yar missile base in the Soviet Union where nuclear warheads were stored in this one building. Saucer hovers over it, sends down laser-like beams. You know, the Russians had the same problem that the Americans had in England. Um, Moving on to another subject, that's the Dr. Stephen Greer's new uh, serious film, and he also did the 2001 Disclosure UFO project. What do you think about that? Have you taken part in that? Uh, no, and I don't really consider Dr. Greer to be a, a very credible spokesman for this, this subject matter. Really? Uh, Why not? For a variety of reasons. It, uh, much of what he said is speculative, as opposed to being able to document what he says. Um, you know, for example, there was a lot of hype about this serious film, a small alien body being found, and when it was analyzed, it was found to be human DNA, you know, just a deformity, you know, a dwarf type a fetus or, or small entity, human, quite human. Well, that was known before the film came out, and, you know, it appears in the film and so on. So. But he's actually working in the same in the same field as you. He also wants to uh, so? to disclose the UFO phenomena and to tell the people about it. But does he do, do a credible job of what he says he's attempting to do? In my view, no. And I've made no secret of that over the years. There are people who make are make speculative statements if you ask them to verify it. I have 140 military witnesses. I have their back their military records proving they were at these bases. They're independently describing the same number of things. Stephen Greer, on the other hand, and other people in it who call themselves ufologists or disclosure advocates, much of what they say is based on uh, well, speculative thinking. What would the aliens do if, they, if we knew they were here? You know, how would they react to us? They would give us free energy. Certainly, we wouldn't need to use oil and nuclear power anymore. Well, probably not. If you're an alien race who's visiting Earth, you know that our history is to make weapons and kill each other with, with a, as much efficiency as possible. If you are a smart alien, you're not going to give stupid humans high technology because the odds are we're going to try to make weapons out of it, not heat our homes or drive our cars cleanly. So the reason you don't like Stephen Greer's work is it's not because of rivalry. It's because no. of uh, because you know it's it would be better to work together in the you know doing the same thing, trying to get the same message across to the people. I disagree. Uh, what I do is based on archival documentation, uh, military witnesses discussing what other people do make declarative statements based on speculative thinking, no evidence to support what they say in large part. Have, or have, mm -hmm. or uh, at the citizen hearings in Washington, this business of MJ-12, these fake documents, some of the people said, 
you know, my witnesses are telling me about MJ-12. Well, yeah, they did that to Linda Mooton Howe. You know, they let her around by the nose 30 years you ago. You don't believe the MJ-12 uh, exists? That's exactly right. MJ really? That's, those are the, these are the documents that I'm telling you. These are the ones that I help expose. They were typed up uh, by this agent, Richard Doty, and he lied about it for 30 years and finally admitted it to me in an email in 2009 that he forged documents for government. And that couldn't be disinformation? Also, no, no, other people have found, you know what, again, look at the specifics. You can't just talk in general terms about is this real, is this not real. Take each piece of evidence, see what it supposedly says. What it supposedly said, for example, there was a document supposedly from Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, dated 1977 that talked about an alien on top of a missile silo and guards were shooting at it and so on. Well. The t if you look at it, the typewriter flaws in that, that this is again pre-word processor, this is the old-fashioned typewriters, the letters had a s various signatures, the T was dropped, the, the W had a little mark off the top of one of the lines and so on. Well, you also find those identical flaws in the typewriter from Richard Doty's typewriter at OSI. Yeah, you said that. Have, so, you never, ha have you never been threatened by military officials not to speak about this? I, I have been harassed. Um, I went on the college lecture circuit in December of 1980, or excuse me, September of 1981, and by February of 82, when I would call military witnesses that appear in my book and say, may I tape record our conversation? They say, sure. Um, within, for all of 82, when I did that, as soon as I hung up the phone, within one minute or five minutes or half an hour, I would get a call. Someone was on the other end saying nothing. I could hear background noises and then they would hang up the phone. So quite clearly someone, and that only happened immediately after one of my conversations with these military sources. So it's not something that's ongoing? Um, there have been variations on that. It was, uh, this is again when I first began to get some national publicity and I think that whoever was doing that, CIA, NSA, who knows, was just trying to scare me, scare me off of doing it. I'm too stupid to be scared. But on the other hand, uh, have you not been invited to join, to no. join the military to be like a disinformer? No. No? no, that has never happened. I think that no. And uh, Bill Moore, who was a well-known civilian researcher, he admitted that he was recruited by this Richard Doty, who duped Linda Howe. And in, I published my first paper on MJ-12 and the fact that it, these documents were being forged by OSI at Kirtland Air Force Base. I published that on March 1st, 1989. And Bill Moore, a civilian researcher, showed up at my door in Albuquerque and tried to intimidate me into retracting all of this. Three months later, on July 1st, 1989, he spoke at the MUFON Organization International Symposium. He admitted finally 90% of what I said in my paper, that he was recruited by OSI, that he was told that if he spied on other researchers, a group called APRO, and reported what the, uh, those people were doing back to the Air Force. The government, the Air Force said they would give him very top secret information. Same thing they told Linda Howe. So Bill Moore, you know, even though he was, you know, basically, uh, you know, agreed to spy on a fellow, fellow researchers for the government, and, you know, everybody thinks that's quite despicable, he at least had the honesty to say, yes, I was suckered. I was duped by Air Force counterintelligence. So was Linda Howe, but Linda Howe's never been willing to admit it because her ego or her general gullibility.